All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Lori Black, and I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience here at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. We are very excited to uh, present this, uh, this edition in our series of uh, Klezmer Workshops. Um, Kurt, Kurt Bjorling uh, needs little introduction in the Klezmer world, uh, but, he, uh, but we are just so, so lucky to have him. Uh, before we get started, I do have a few announcements. Um, so for anyone that is interested in music of American Jewish experience, and that's all of you because you are here, highly encourage uh, all of you, if you are not already uh, on our mailing list, please do join our mailing list because we do have more programs. Uh, in fact, we have another one coming up this weekend on Sunday. Uh, we will have the final chapter in our series, Kol Nidre Audio Visual Dramaturgies. Um, this has been a, a very exciting and successful series, and we're sorry to see it end, but we do hope that you'll join us. Um, this has been organized by our own director, Professor Mark Kligman, and Dr. Ruthie Avelievich uh, at the University of Haifa. Um, so now on, on to our programming. And I should say we have many things coming in the new year, so join that mailing list. You don't want to miss out. Um, so now, uh, we are very lucky to be learning today with Kurt lucky. Bjorling, a uh, multi-instrumentalist who uh, we, uh, on various albums has been heard on clarinet, bass clarinet, basset horn, cymbal, saxophone, accordion, um, a variety and of ocarina. instruments. And ocarina, most importantly. <laughs> Um, Kurt has toured and recorded with the Klezmatics New York, um, in New York and violinist Yitzhak Perlman uh, since 92. He has been a member of Brave Old World. He has composed pieces for orchestra and soloists. Um, Suite of Yiddish Music was commissioned in December of 91 by the Concordia Chamber Symphony at New York's Lincoln Center. Uh, concertino on klezmer music themes was commissioned by the Huntington Symphony with members of the Cincinnati Klezmer Project, um, uh, among other works. And Kurt has, of course, taught at, at various musical settings, including the annual Yiddish folk arts program sponsored by Yivo Institute and Living Tradition Traditions, the Multicultural uh, Folk Arts Center's Klezmer Music Camp at Buffalo Gap, West Virginia, and at numerous European, American, Canadian festivals and workshops. And now we are very, very excited to have him today. And oh no, Kurt is sideways. Let's try this again. We're getting dizzy. <laughs> there we go. Fabulous. Kurt, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with us. Oh, and you know, I forgot to say, everyone, this is a work. Uh, it, this The easiest way to hear and to enjoy this, uh, this workshop is through headphones. Go ahead and put those on if you've got them. And uh, Kurt, I'll let you take it away from here. Okay, I'm going to proceed as if I'm teaching a class to a group of fairly advanced students. And I don't want that to be intimidating or discouraging or exclusionary toward anybody. This whole program is being recorded and I'm assured that anybody who is here attending this will have access to it in the future. So rather than going slowly and carefully through a number of different things and, and allowing time for people to confirm that they've got it, I'm going to take somewhat the opposite approach. I'm going to move rather quickly, knowing that any and all of you can return and review this at your own pace. And I say this confessing that I myself am a slow learner. I cannot count the times that somebody has heard me somewhere after seeing me get started working on something and commented at how well I how well I learned it, how well I play it, and I have to point out, yes, I picked it up, but I wasn't able to make use of that information right away. I took what I picked up from the occasion, I went home with it, I practiced, and maybe it's because it was so difficult for me, I practiced more carefully and more thoroughly 
with the result that everybody was impressed and think that I did some major thing of, of so quickly and, and completely assimilating something that they found difficult. So I'm encouraging any and all participants to take the same approach. If you find that this is going at a pace that leaves you confused, simply go back and go through it all again. I will do my best to be methodical and to present things in a good order so that I'm not jumping into some already um, advanced degree of all this. Um, that said, I'm open to suggestions and questions. And there are people here who will be fielding questions as they come along. In particular, if there's something you simply do not understand, raise your, do the virtual hand raising or put something in the chat window to say that you simply don't understand the point that I'm making regardless of whether it's moving quickly or not. That's something I would want to address right away. I'm torn between talking to get this thing going and listening to something. Um, I want to get us in the mood. So even though this isn't the subject we're going to address right now, I'm going to ask Lori to cue up the, the, the Bugic piece that is uh, that says excerpt Vorspiel. With no point except let's let's dip our toes into some of the sounds here. Patterslied, the Yosit Leit Bugic. Okay, this was only a very short excerpt. The piece that we just heard goes on for several minutes, and we just heard just a taste. Um, helps get me in the mood, at least, for what we're about to deal with. I would ask a question of each of you without expecting an answer in response. I want you to ask yourself this question and, and take note of your own answer. Would you say that what we just heard made use of a little or a moderate amount or a great deal of expression and ornamentation? Okay. Um, the speaker. Maybe we'll listen to it again with that question in mind, but think about that. Was this player using modest or limited expression and ornamentation, a moderate amount or quite a bit? It relates to things that we'll get into as we go along here. I feel like ornamentation is often is often overemphasized in the teaching and discussion of klezmer music. Uh, too much ornamentation is a common critique that is given to players, to performances of klezmer music older, more experienced players and teachers, I would say that's, I would say the most frequent critique I hear given to younger players, including to me when I was a younger player of this music, is by older, more experienced musicians saying, yeah, don't use so much ornamentation. And at some point I realized it's not necessarily an issue of how much ornamentation you use, yeah. but rather how you use it and how well it serves the musical purposes at hand. Some of the best performances of klezmer music I know, in fact, use an extremely large amount of expression, nuance, and ornamentation. Um, but they work Kurt, because, yes. I, there's a very pertinent question I this, uh, that I just, I, I apologize for interrupting, but uh, no problem. someone asked to define ornamentation. Oh, okay. No, we can't define ornamentation. <laughs> that's, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, 
one person's ornament is another person's nuance is another person's integral part of a melody. So you can pretty you can make some pretty clear cases if you've got a fairly plain melody and one player chooses to play a trill on a particular tone where others don't you can pretty clearly say well that was an act of ornamentation adding a frilly little bit of something decorative but that's pretty obvious and most of the cases we're talking about are not so obvious i don't think it's necessary for us to draw a clear and black line between what's basic and what's ornamentation it's something we know when we hear it and uh, is a part of interpretation. I hope that answer satisfies you. If not, I'd just say continue dipping your toes, feet, all of you into this music and you'll have your own opinions and I won't disagree with your, your freedom to exercise your opinion. The, the criticism of too much ornamentation I found is usually not a matter of quantity but of applying ornaments and expressions effectively. And many performances use a great deal of nuance and ornamentation and are wonderful because each of these nuances, each of these little ornaments and graces serves the purpose of delivering something good in the music. And that's something that you have to develop your own taste for. Part of the reason for this is that when, when we're taught to play klezmer music, very often certain particular expressions and ornaments are highlighted, sometimes even to the point of calling them klezmer style ornaments or klezmer style expressions. The result is we get the, we consciously or not get the feeling that, oh, in order to play Jewish music, I have to use these Jewish expressions. By doing so, we are automatically setting up a kind of a dichotomy between us and us over here and the other people's music, the other culture's music over there. And I like to avoid things like that. I don't have categories in my mind of Jewish ornaments or Jewish expressions. When I learn a useful expression, it becomes part of my vocabulary and I will use it anywhere and everywhere that I think it's appropriate. So if I choose not to play Krechtsen while playing Bach or Mozart, it's not because I believe that there is some rule or boundary that I would be crossing by doing that. It's simply that I don't think the music is, is helped by adding those expressions. But if I find a place where I think it is, I will use it and I won't feel any compunction about feeling like I'm somehow using the wrong ornament from the wrong idiom in the wrong place. Excuse me, it's dry here. A related aspect to all this is that when we identify certain features, certain stylistic elements, certain nuances, certain ornaments and expressive elements, we think, oh, here's a wonderful thing. Here's a wonderful device I can use to make my playing more klezmer-like, more Jewish, more true to the character of the tune. This also is a little bit of a separation between the thing and what it's used for. And I constantly urge myself and I urge all of you to get over that point, to make expressions that you use part of your palette of resources and use them without, without differentiating, without thinking that there's a need or a requirement to do so, use them where they, where they work. My best analogy is to talk about language. Imagine yourself in any situation speaking or listening to somebody speak. With simple expressions, we can express urgency, interest, boredom, anger, humor. We can signify that we're wondering or questioning something. Our tone of voice, our delivery of words and uh, syllables conveys all of this. I'm, con I'm conveying thoughtful hesitation as I'm speaking now. 
little bursts of words punctuated by space where I think for a moment, clarify what it is I'm saying, and then I deliver it. I do not for one moment think how I'm going to do this. I am not consciously thinking, I will raise my voice here. I'll cut this syllable short. I will, I will bend my voice upward or downward. If I want to express irony or questioning or anger, humor, I will do it the same way we all do when we speak. We simply do it. If we're chastising a child, if we're, if we're feeling uh, apologetic about something we did wrong, we express it, we suggest it with our voice, and we don't think about how to do it. No more than we think about what to do with our toes and our ankles when we're running. We start out life not able to even walk, much less run. But before long, we're walking, and then we're running, and then we just do it. And I urge everyone playing klezmer music or any kind of music, take the elements that you receive as part of that musical style, and as much as possible, as soon as possible, make them into elements that you use in the same way that you use inflection in speaking, and in the same way that you understand inflection when someone else is speaking, that you don't separate them, you don't think, well, I'm playing Jewish music, so I better use a certain proportion of these kinds of expressions here or there or the other. Try to take the tune or the piece or the function for which you're playing and deliver your musical self into them with whatever level of skill and ability you have, but make it as natural as you can. And be ready to later think, hmm, I didn't do such a good job. Maybe I did this in the wrong place. Maybe I did too much but learn from that and do more and better all of the time. With that in mind, I'll talk about one of these things that I think is, is an example of one of these things that I think gets separated, presented, and then becomes a thing unto itself, separated from the purpose for which you do it. And this is a thing that I call nudgy rhythm. Oh, excuse me. I've covered three general subjects here in the beginning. The first one was mentioning the issue of uh, over accentuation of new, well, yeah, of, of us taking the things that we learn and then using them for their own sake and overemphasizing them instead of using them appropriately. Number two was this issue of using, using musical expression the way we do when talking. I, I, you can call this storytelling. The third one is this issue of identifying elements and then generalizing them and using them too broadly or automatically as opposed to in the places where they're appropriate. If any of those three general subjects is one that you would like us to get into in more detail, send a message, send a, send a, put something in the chat to, to mention this. And when we take a little break and consider some questions, we'll also consider whether to emphasize one of those things when we come back. Likewise, I'm now going to hit several specific subjects with some examples and we'll play and sing together. And if any of these subjects is one that catches you and you want to go more deeply into it here in this session, send some little message mentioning it. So we have now, we've covered those three basic elements and now we're getting into one of the, an example of one of them, which as I say, I call nudgy rhythm. This is my own term. Maybe others have picked it up, I don't know. I don't think it's particularly good or bad, but I know what it is when I'm talking about it. And that is the playing of sequences of notes where each pair of notes is, is played not with equal rhythmic value, but with the first one a little bit shorter and the second one having a little bit more time. So a phrase in which all of the note values could, and in many circumstances would be played more or less equally, such as this. Gets played with a little bit of a push on the first. This is what I call, to me, each little pair of notes is like somebody nudging at you. They're trying to get you to do something. They're pushing you, not necessarily forcefully, but there's an urgency to it. 
So instead of even roughly equal tones, we hear I hope this is clear enough. Here's a good example where if you're confused at this point and thinking, oh, I need to hear more, remember, you can go and play this whole thing back again. Maybe make a note now of the time if that helps you to f find the space you want. But I'm simply going to let that serve as an example and proceed directly with talking about this. I'm playing in G, by the way. So if you're start ready to start playing along, join in on your own. Make sure that you're uh, uh, muted. We don't want a chaos of sounds all c coming all together here, but you can play along with me. If that's complicated, simply sing along with me. But here we have a simple melody. In which these pairs of 16th notes sound very effective when played nudgily. But in the phrase which follows, the 16th notes aren't played like that. And if I do play them like that, they start to sound a little bit overdone. This thing that gives the opening phrase a nice lilt a nice bounce starts to become kind of jerking. Maybe you disagree. Your own taste is your own and use it <laughs> always with confidence, but be ready to change. <laughs> and um, in my sensibility, Da, 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 makes me feel like now instead of being nudged forward, I'm being jerked around and I don't like it. The difference is the opening phrase is full of repeated tones. Each pair of tones involves two different, each pair of notes involves two different tones, but each two note phrase starts on the same tone that preceded it in the preceding pair. <laughs> And in my experience, the places where nudgy rhythms work is almost invariably phrases like this. Having said that, I want to say I don't like making rules. Rules seem useful, but they are very dangerous. So don't write in your notebook, only play nudgy rhythms in repeated note phrases. I would say use that as a piece of advice to test your own sensibility, explore phrases, explore tunes, and explore places where you might be tempted to use this and see whether you agree with me. Even if you do agree with me, don't make it a rule, but maybe use it as a little uh, reference point. Descending phrases often use these replays, so you'll... Something like this makes perfect sense for these little nudgy rhythms. We're going to practice this a little bit. First, by simplifying this melody. So if you're playing along, singing along, I'm going to play the notes G, B, D, C, D, B, C, A flat. Ending with B, G, B, G. Then I repeat the whole thing and simply repeat the note G at the end. Here we'll go through the whole sequence with the repetition ending with the repeated G. If we were all 
all together in a room, I would be now asking questions. What do you observe? What do you hear? We can't do that in this virtual setting very effectively. I will simply tell you. So far, I'm playing this in what I consider a fairly neutral way. But I can't convince myself to really do that. I would have to forcibly tell myself, play every tone flat and level. And I don't enjoy doing that because it doesn't feel very good. Consciously or not, I'm putting a little bit of bounce into each tone. And if I'm really trying to play musically, I generally put a bit more of that in than I've done so far. striking each tone with a fairly clear, definite attack, not accenting it, just planting it very firmly, and then letting it die away. Maybe completely, or maybe it's on the way to dying away, but it doesn't get there because the next tone appears. So let's play those tones very long, and just a few of them in order, each one dying down to nothing. This is very different than going Obviously. Now let's let them die a little more quickly. I think you see where this is going. Now let's put them in more or less good good rhythmic relationship to each other. If they don't completely die away before the next tone starts, okay. This is something you can do on your own and decide how much of this is a good thing. And the next step is to use that exact same attack, hitting the notes firmly, letting them ring full length, but dying gradually away and make them into pairs of tones. So instead of we play and instead of we play faster. at the melody. Becomes This is where you might have some questions. So note those down for yourself and we get to, and when we get to time to for some discussion and questions, bring those up. One of the things I often hear as a result of teaching this Nuji rhythm, which others may not call Nuji rhythm, as far as I know, I'm the only person who calls it that, is that this feeling of nudging forward against the short words fail me at this point. The musical thing that we're doing of playing, attacking a two note figure with a short first note often causes many people to be led to thinking that everything is short about this, and it becomes And as you can hear, this immediately sounds rather brittle and abrupt. Again, it, re it returns us to a feeling of being jerked around rather than being nudged or pushed forward. Nonetheless, I would say don't make a rule. Don't think, Kurt said, only play them long and drawn out with the decay. Don't play them short and pointy. You will find places where short, pointy ones are exactly what you want to hear and play. But have a range, 
have a range of expression that you can use on this, going from to where you're holding it full length. And in between these two is one where the note dies away so quickly that it ends before you get to the next one. But because it dies gracefully, you still have the feeling that you're gliding through this thing rather than being bumped through it. I hope you can hear the difference between and the main difference being that the second note in one case gets terminated abruptly shortly after it sounds and the other where it simply goes bum and disappears quite quickly. And when you get up to tempo on a tune like this, the latter is the one that bounces and bubbles us forward. And so on and so forth. I would say there's one important exception to the not a rule that I mentioned earlier about these nuji rhythms being effective primarily or solely in repeated note figures, and that is in much slower tempos. It's not unusual to play a, a slow or stately melody where the 16th notes, instead of feeling like these, these quick, light running phrases, are steady, almost, almost, um, um, almost andante in character. And sometimes we use nuji rhythms in phrases like that. I just played it in a rather wooden and square way. But the nuji rhythms work backwards also in not only the nuji pairs, but the delayed pairs. So it's typical of me that I play a phrase like that with the first note lengthened rather than shortened, sort of like pulling us into the beginning of the phrase, but followed by some nuji rhythms that sort of balance and bounce against that. The significant thing here is I don't play repeated sequences of pairs all in the nuji rhythm. It's a little thing that I introduce now and then if I want to create a little extra urgency in the melody. But if I do it throughout, I think you will agree, it quickly becomes boring or stiff, or it just takes on a kind of a mannered quality that no longer serves the musical purposes. <laughs> I'm sorry, you might love that and you are welcome to love it, but I have to say I hear a lot of that and I often think something is wrong, Some, something is not being understood, a story is being told and it's being told with the wrong accent or the wrong emphasis on colors or characters or something. Um, put all of these into your mixing bowl, test them, try them, experiment and explore, and I hope that that's fun. I'm going to move on to another but closely related subject. And let's listen to some more recorded examples. Um, let's listen to, let's listen to that bit of Vorspiel again from uh, Avram Bugic. Laurie, if you're ready, play us again that same sample we heard earlier. said before, this is only the opening statement of a long three meter section like this, played prayerfully, 
and calmly, and yet, as you will notice, with lots of little bits of urgency. We will come back to that subject later. I only want you to hear this so that you understand the mood with, that is the beginning of this piece, which is followed by a chosadl, which we will now listen to. So, Laurie, play us now. The portion we heard is, I would say, maybe roughly one-tenth of the entire prelude, Vorspiel, and with a brief pause during which the notes of the instruments are still ringing before they start, we then hear this chosadl, which, Gloria, it just says excerpt. <laughs> that there's a considerable amount of nudgy rhythm being played in this example, and that it's a tune with lots of repeated notes, like discussed earlier. But there's another element going on here. Um, Laurie, is it easy for you to specify uh, a certain point in time on a recording like this and start it at that sure. time marking? Okay, get ready to start this at 54 seconds in. Okie dokie. We hear we hear in this. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> we hear in this tune two sections. We call it the A section and the B section. The the A the, the player goes through A and B and then returns to the A section and that's where we're going to hear it. Just because the first time through, he's still kind of getting in the mood. He's playing it in a. He's just come out of this beautiful rubato uh, expressive prelude. And he comes into the piece rather graceful. But by the time he comes back to the A section, he's very settled into his tempo. And that's where I want us to hear this. And this is where I want you to hear the beginning. I'm going to play the, the opening tones as square as I can. And I admit this is difficult and it's kind of painful for me to make myself do this, but I will do my best. I'm just playing a sequence of tones and I'm trying to avoid emphasizing where I think the beat is. <laughs> Is this the note that's on the beat or this? And then the second phrase or so. Listen, we're going to listen twice. Go ahead and hit that at 54 seconds, Lori. There is no question that the violinist is playing the lower note of each pair before the beat as we hear it from the piano. Mm -hmm. 
The lower tone G we hear before the piano plays its downbeat bass note, and we hear the melody note C above that, occurring more or less with that bass note and the following chord. Again, the note, the movement from the G up to an E flat. It's the E flat that lands closest to where the beat is being played by the pianist. But the question is, are those lower tones that we hear just before the beat, are they pickup notes anticipating where we feel the beat or something else? Let's listen again from that same midpoint. Thank you. Lori, thank you for your help and for your enthusiasm and everything else that you've projected from the beginning of our first conversation about this. My uh, pleasure. <laughs> not apropos of anything in particular, but just being reminded, I'm, I'm grateful to you for all of those things and for us all being here together. This again is where, in a room full of people, this is where I would love to be asking for a show of hands and, for, and, for, and inviting some questions. And we would discuss and try to say, well, what's going on and what isn't going on? I will skip over all that and tell you what I think is going on, and I would invite you to return to this, review, listen, and get your own opinion, but here's what I understand is going on. Well, I'm not going to say what I think. We're going to just do this together. So, I'm going to put my beat here, and I'm going to sing that lower note G and then the G in the next phrase and the C in the next phrase where they occur from the violinist just before the beat let's all do that together again ready now Bum 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 Okay. Now let's sing those lower tones clearly on the beat. The reason being, the phrases that we hear after this descending are quite clear. Bum 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 Here. The note that moves is heard on the beat, and the following note, which gets repeated, is heard as, as the second half of its little part. Bum, 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 bum. So we're going to play, sing, whatever. Play if you want to. I don't know if I've gone off pitch. It doesn't matter right now to me. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so we're now putting the lower tone of each pair on the beat. Bum 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 Now let's do it before the beat, like it's a little pickup note in each phrase. Bum 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 Okay, no problem, either way. If it is a problem, review, play along, sing along, whatever. But now we're going to do something different. We're going to play those attack notes before the beat, just like the violinist does but we're going to articulate them as downbeat notes. So, we're going to, rhythmically, we're going to sing them but we're going to articulate them, attack those tones as if they are You got that? So let's do them as pickup notes, ready, Go. 
boom, 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 and now on the beat. Boom, 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 boom. Fine, right? Now let's attack them as downbeat notes, but before the beat. Boom, 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 and now on the beat squarely. Bum 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 bum. And now squarely planting them as downbeats, but before the beat. Bum 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 well, uh, Laura, let's do it from the beginning when he first starts into this. me happy. Um, you may notice in the B section, the major could be He stays pretty plainly on the beat until Suddenly he's he's pushing the notes in front of the beat, almost a full note ahead of where the beat occurs. I urge you to take examples like this and then to experiment with other music that you play, other tunes, other subgenres of klezmer music. Find places where you find things like this might apply. We're going to hear what uh, in when I've done presentations like this of this subject with groups. The re each of you is presumably sitting at home alone or with maybe one or two other people. So you'd, we don't have this shared experience of being a room full of people clapping a beat and singing these things and playing these things along. But I will explain. I've been delighted when I've presented this kind of material. And we do all the different steps. We do it before the beat, we do it on the beat, and then we do it with that funny thing of hitting it on the beat, but arriving before the beat. And then I tell everybody, okay, now let's go back and let's just put it plainly on the beat. And I say, what is the thing? And everybody says, it's boring. And I feel relieved and gratified because that's what I hope people would say, but I can't force them to think or feel that. I wonder whether you're having a similar reaction. I don't know. But let's listen, to, just so that we understand that this is not some anomaly. We're not hearing one particular and peculiar player with a, with a rhythmic idiosyncrasy. We are now going to hear an entire ensemble playing the opening phrase 
of a rather plain melody, again involving lots of repetition of up and down notes, and playing well ahead of the beat at the beginning, settling onto the beat somewhere in the middle, but toward the end, as they get toward the end of the phrase before repeating the whole thing, again, you hear phrases that push forward, no longer involving phrases starting ahead of the beat, but phrases starting and then rushing ahead so that the ending notes arrive before the beat. It creates a feeling of tension, of excitement, and here we go, this is the, Lori, this is the one titled, um, The Rebbe is Gegangen. is not clear, the melody simply bobs up and down. But the band melody players are starting a full note ahead of the rhythm. Then they settle down, settle into and then rush it and at various points throughout the rest in the phrases. The phrases rush ahead. So So a phrase that ends they get to that ending note so that the that, that little upper auxiliary ba -de -ba, is the one that occurs on the You can review and listen for your own sake, but let's move on to other things. Say, starting with the fact that we're almost an hour into this. So this is a point where I would like to allow for some questions. Maybe maybe some questions have already been answered in the chat. Maybe some of you have, have raised hands. Oh, and I'm being delivered a list. Um, uh, of some questions. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to simply, oh, there's just two of these here. Um, it says, if you're working in an ensemble, don't we need to coordinate and agree how, where to use the embellishment? Hmm, I'm going to need to ask for some clarification or spe more specificity. Um, and a second one says, using emphasis slash accents appropriately. Uh, oh, it's a focus wish. I don't know what a focus wish is, but maybe someone can explain it to me. You asked earlier what they wanted, and uh, that was the reply. Oh, focus, uh, uh, focus wish. I still don't know what a focus wish is, but it'll, it'll all become clarified in due course. Uh, does anyone have a hand raised with a question that they want to ask? Feel free to raise your hand or even just, uh, yeah, oh, Henry Morgan. So on the guy with that uh, question you were stumbling over at the beginning with the ensemble uh -huh. question, uh, it seems to me that you have to agree within the ensemble about how to use whatever the embellishment is, otherwise you end up with a pretty bad mess if everybody's doing their own embellishment every place, right? Hmm. So there's some, some kind of coordination that needs to happen, whether that's, um, whether that comes about because the ensemble is tight and they really know each other well, 
or whether there's some predecision about this section is going to go this way and we want this to happen? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question that has a wide it has it has a family of possible answers and solutions and it depends a lot on what what the overall style you're projecting is there are examples of klezmer music by for instance dave taras from the late 1930s early 1940s especially in his trio where things are so lean and so trimmed there's a neatness and and a and a and an accuracy about what's going on that you can imagine that if the clarinet and the accordion, for instance, would be playing the melody at the same time and doing things in different ways, it could sound cluttered or confusing. But they simply avoid that by never playing the melody at the same time. The accordion accompanies the clarinet, and then the accordion occasionally takes over the melody. And this is in the context of a trio where there aren't other uh, melody instruments around. On the other hand, in some of Dave Taras's earliest recordings that he made in the 1920s and in numerous ensemble recordings, both small and large, you hear a great variety in rhythmic attack, nuance, and ornamentation between different instruments. And it can sometimes sound a little bit chaotic, but if all of the players involved have a sense of direction, have a sense of purpose and intent, these things add up to a beautiful a beautiful spaghetti of sounds. Spaghetti is the wrong word. I usually use spaghetti when I mean something so 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 mixed up that you can't make heads or tails of it but um this is, again is a matter of taste but i would say intent intent and understanding of what a melody is trying to say and how you can serve that or how you can amplify that these are the primary ingredients i wonder if you mean do you feel like you have to agree like all the melody instruments have to agree whether they will play a trill on a certain note or use a certain expression i would say I would think, no, you don't need to, but you do need to know where you're going and not sound like you're waiting for someone else, waiting to, waiting to hear what they do or trying to coordinate in the way we do, would in a careful chamber music ensemble. Um, that might not be a satisfying answer, I don't know, but I would say I like some of the feeling of music that sounds what I call congregational, like a bunch of people Imagine a bunch of instrumentals playing in a way that's like a bunch of people singing, some with greater skill than others, some with a little more overt expression than others, and it all adds up to a body of sound that you enjoy being in and amongst and which makes you feel like dreaming or dancing or like you're hearing a wonderful story for which there are no good words. Um, is that a satisfactory answer for you? It helps. Thank you. My hope is that there are others with the same question and that my answer was satisfying for them as well. Anything else that anybody, is there another, is there a raised hand at this point? Someone ready with a question? If not, that's okay. I'm not expecting them, just allowing for them. Doesn't look like it. Okay. We will go on with some listening. Should I explain what that question is? Oh, okay, okay. So you had asked my my, if, my, if, my wonderful assistant is here. If they wanted to focus on anything, or if they wanted to get ah, deeper focus into with anything. using emphasis and accents appropriately. Okay, so one one auditor said in in wanting to wanting to focus on things wants to know about using emphasis and accents appropriately. Well. That sounds like it's an invitation to make some rules, but I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have rules. I would like to say this is like a language. If, if you have rules for when and where to use emphasis to convey whatever it is you want to convey, whatever urgency or inquiry or uh, irony it is that you want your vocal inflection to have, then maybe you could use rules to do the same thing in music, but I want to say build up a collection, build up a palette of expressions, and then just use them when they you think they work well and best. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question. Maybe we will get into some of it with some of the examples that we will hear here. Um, it's sort of the wrong time to do it, having already heard these things, but I want to frame what it is we've listened to so far. The first two recordings that we heard, as I say, are two different parts of one long recording. It was a homemade recording by a violinist who was a member of this klezmer family in the, in the Romanian town of Yash. 
there was a long dynasty of Klesmorum of the family named Bugic. One member of this family emigrated to America, Yankel, who published a tune under the name of Jack Bugic, phonetically spelled B-O-O-G-I-T-C-H or something like that. Um, the Romanian spelling is B-U-G-H-I-C-I. -I. The final I is not articulated as a vowel. The final I tells us that the C is pronounced CH instead of K. So there were numerous members of this, of, in several generations of this family of Klesmorum, and they made some homemade recordings, I think sometime during the 1960s. Um, and these in turn, a copy of these in turn, ended up in an archive, of a sound archive in Jerusalem. And uh, I can't get into the whole history, but it's not a commercial recording. It was something made by the performers themselves for their own purposes. And there's a longer, more elaborate history of other things that they that they produced. Part of the reason that I'm able to say with, defin with definiteness about the phrasing and the position in relation to the beat of those notes of the melody is that another collection of recordings made of some notated music by members of the Bugic family included that melody in which it's then very clear which notes are written as being on the beat, even though the violinist we heard is playing them before the beat. Um, discovering that latter representation was an aha moment for me, um, as you can imagine. Um, Laurie, let's hear the thing that's labeled Vernadsky CD1, track number two. Not yet, though. I'll explain. Vernadsky is the name of the uh, National Library of Ukraine, the Vernadsky National Library of Ukraine, where an enormous amount of Judaica is, is gathered and assembled, including a number of the recordings that were made by Soviet ethno eth ethnomusicologists as, as uh, research work and some pre-Soviet recordings that were made by, um, names are escaping me, words are escaping me. I guess I'm already getting tired. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Zinovi, uh, Z Zusman Kisselhoff made numerous uh, field recordings before the Russian Revolution. And it's possible that some of these that we hear are among those. I didn't, I didn't go back into tracing oh. where these come from. But the Vernadsky Library has issued a series of CDs collecting some of these recordings that they have on old cylinders. I'm telling you all this to say they're very interesting. There's a lot of interesting material among them, but it can be a long, hard slog listening through to all of these CDs, looking for the little gems that surface. And a warning is that many of the recordings have little parts cut out of them. But whereas on a reissue of, a, of an old phonograph record, when there's a skip in the groove, you will actually hear some kind of a little click. You'll hear music playing along and then there'll be a pop and you'll either hear a phrase or section repeated or it'll jump ahead a groove and, and you'll get a, a bit of fragment of music that is not well connected to what preceded it. On these digitally produced recordings, there are numerous places where a little, a little bit, either just a single tone or a half of a phrase or an entire phrase is missing, but there is no telltale click or silence to tell us that something wrong has happened. And there are examples on each of these recordings that we're going to hear. So ignore the fact that there might be an occasional little oddity of phrase or continuity. I want you to listen to the delivery of the music as we hear it here. So let's hear is one this the one track two. Okay.
Laurie, I leave it up to you whether you think um, uh, projecting the, the notation that I gave for this will help or not. Uh, I'll refer to this. Um, well, um, why not? It's queued up. Okay, so we can do it if we want to see it. Um, my main reason for us hearing this recording is that I want all of you to discover that in addition to singing in a very nice, very relaxed, very compelling way, which is how I find this, there is a feeling of propulsion behind almost every little sub phrase. It's not exaggerated. There's not a feeling of insistence. It's more like a, well, it's, it's not commanding us to go. It's asking us to join in and, and, and pushing us forward. This notation is just my own penciled scribble and it's from at least 20 years ago. I'm not presenting it as an accurate transcription. It's just the thing I wrote down, but it gives us a reference point. So let's listen to this again, but don't let your eyes get too glued to the notation. Um, listen to the sound and listen for places where the tones are attacked and die gracefully away. cursor to um, to like circle around things point at sure. them okay so in the very oh, you first know, you know what actually unfortunately it's not enabled for me right now okay I'll tell everybody I think this will be pretty simple and straightforward in the very first phrase ba -ba 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 -ba, that final note what's written here in by the way G is simply a neutral key that I picked for writing these things down I was sitting and listening. I didn't have any kind of an instrument or source of pitch as, as a reference point. I just wrote these. I transcribed a whole bunch of these one afternoon, all in the key of, all in the tonality of G. So in the first phrase, the, the quarter note written here as a B flat, listen to that when we hear this, listen to how it dies gracefully away as opposed to being ended suddenly or cut off abruptly. The same thing at, in the third line, the last tone there in the second ending. It's held for almost an entire bar. Listen to how that dies gracefully. And then in the final section, that B flat, which is written as two tied eighth notes in the middle of the bottom line. Listen to how that note dies gracefully away. These are not the only examples, but I want you to be sure to notice these while keeping your ears open for others. First phrase, the final note, B-flat. The second time we get endings on the second ending, the ending note, B-flat, and the B-flat in the middle of the third passage. Let's hear the whole thing. And like I say, don't get too glued to the notes, but be, take particular notice of those and see if you don't hear other similar things happening on many other places in this. And at the same time, recognize the feeling that this gives us, there's this throbbing, pulsating sense of rhythm. No drummers drumming, no bass players giving anything. This simple voice alone gives us this very compelling dance-like rhythm. And in fact, the title of the piece is Freilux. It's a, it's a dance melody and played in a very danceable way by this vocalist. Here we go. Da 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 da
Each of those notes that I highlighted is not held long. It's they're cut a little bit short because the singer needs to breathe, but he doesn't simply hold the note and then chop it off and give himself time to take a breath. He 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 sings those tones, yum bum bum, and they they fade away quickly into nothing. And it even gives us the illusion as listening that they last longer than they actually do in fact. Let's listen to um, track number eight. Please, Laurie. <laughs> The ringling cazarm of the roiler bang is right. The ringling cazarm of the roiler bang. The name is not so good right. The children cazarm are a reason. When you saw the red and the ring to me, the children are a big session. The papa was one who had been caught again. Boy, it was a good and a time by it. The recording itself, as published, cuts off at the end that way. Again, the thing that I find particularly compelling about this performance, it's, it's a man singing a folk song it's got a rather dark subject. He's talking about coming out of his house and finding a pogrom in process, people being chased through the streets and, and, and injured and murdered. And um, it's not a happy subject. And yet, he's delivering this melody with this feeling of, of uh, I would so no longer say, it's no longer bouncing. It's not a dance-like rhythm. And yet, there is this propulsive rhythm that gives a sense of urgency. He's not just going da 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 dum da ba bum bum. It's not march like. It's not declamatory. It's got this urgency to it, telling us. To me, it says, "Listen, listen, listen. I've got something for you. I've got something. It's good stuff. Listen, listen, listen." And he pauses sometimes. He lets time go by without counting it as rhythm. He gets to the end of a phrase and uh, wait. Wait. But this it's like a lot of uh tunes that we hear sung without words, where the, the not so nonsensical nonsense syllables that are sung give the same feeling of proportion. But here he's singing words and he's getting the same kind of, of propulsive nuance and urgency that we get from hearing a chassid sing Let's listen to just a little bit. Give us like 20 seconds of it again, Laurie. Oh, sorry. Let me cue it right back up. Just yeah. one quick second. Clicked out of it. Uh, it was number eight, correct? Yes. Okay. 
Good, and let's hear one more. This is the one track labeled track 19. It says that this is the Reb David Karliner's Niggen. Again, these ringing tones, yum bum bum bum, and the and the quicker notes that follow, yum bum, I they are da da dum. They have the same throbbing pulse, yum yum bum yum bum bum yum bum. As an instrumentalist, I of course listen primarily to instrumental recordings. Um, and I accept the definition that klezmer music is, by definition, an instrumental music. But Yiddish music, as a body of musical style and components, is all interrelated. And vocal music has many of the same elements that we get in klezmer music. Let's listen now from the beginning again. And now we have long tones, a slow tempo. Listen how nearly every single tone sung by this man rings with gentle gracefulness. When he cuts a note off sharp and short, it's to give emphasis because he's created this nice floating and flowing body with this, again, with this throbbing rhythm. No percussion instruments, no driving so-called rhythm section. The melody is giving us the throbbing rhythm, the urgency to move forward at this very relaxed, calm pace, and yet absolutely urgent. We may be calm, we may be relaxed, but we can't stop and stand still. We're carried forward. Listen to tone execution and the delivery of nuance and pulse from the beginning. Yeah. 
Thank you. Another strong element in this is the delivery of tones that carry us to the next tone by, you can call it elision, you can call it portamento. I don't have a specific term, I guess I like portamento. So we're going to examine a simple melody that gives us a good chance to make use of that. This man singing here, yeah, yeah, I can't do it right. I can't do it justice. I just, he's too good. Um, uh, yeah. At the end of it, he first soars upward, and then comes falling, but he doesn't slide continuously. And if he did, it would sound grotesque. He didn't go, die, die. He, he elides gracefully and he gives us the illusion that he, that he slid completely across it. So now let's do a little melody together. This is a tune that I learned from a Slonimer Chosid many years ago. Just this much. A pickup. So there are two places to make a descending portamento. Might not be the right use of the term, but anyway. So at the end of the first half of a phrase, picking up the beginning, play along if you can, if your instrument supports this, but sing along more, I would say. Sing along and then figure out how to make this happen on your instrument. And you notice we don't go It's nothing so overt or explicit. We hint that that's what we're doing, but the tone dies away before we arrive at the bottom of We're falling, but we disappear. The sound disappears. I like to say this is like you threw a ball and it went over a rise. It passed over the rise and went beyond, and you don't see the ball anymore, but you know that it's there. You just know that it went over a bush or a rise or something. We do the same thing. We create the same illusion with our tone, our sound. The, the tone is moving somewhere. It gets so far away that we can't hear it anymore, but we know that it's still there. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Now on the clarinet we have a little bit a, a, a technical faculty that supports this. As I'm playing this open tone G, and I begin to slide my way down toward that G where we started. I start to close, I start to, I start to lower the pitch as I'm dying away by closing my fingers, but I start to choke the clarinet. I reach the point where I haven't completely closed these holes, the clarinet won't speak anymore. It chokes and it stops. That's a nice little convenience to have 
that I don't have to do as much to control it, but I could control that with my breath and embouchure as well. It's a nice little thing that then when my fingers finally arrive on the closed holes to produce the tone D, it comes and speaks on its own. The same thing here. I'm going to play a tone up here in what we call the throat of the clarinet. Now I have keys controlling. I don't have as much control, but I can still shade the sound and choke the sound. And when I finally let go of those choking fingers and play the open tone, final note is sitting there we're going to repeat but again I, I hold it and then I point the way to where we're about to go so sing or play where you are pointing the way to where you're about to go but you don't slide well Let's do an experiment. Let's simply slide brutally, firmly, all the way down. And now let's do it a little more gracefully. Try this on your own. Find numerous places, phrases, tunes, melodies, whatever it is where you can make use of this. The exact same thing works in the opposite direction, but requires a bit more care when we sweep upward toward an important note. Um, you want the feeling that this portamento or glissando came from out of nowhere. As tempting as it is to play Rhapsody in Blue and go, we really are not observing the best use of our expression when we do that. That's for showing off. But when you want the melody to show off, oh, I wish I had an example. It comes from way down below, but it comes also from out of nowhere. I do not play. I'm just making this tune up, by the way. I don't know what I'm playing. So experiment with your instrument, with those situations where you feel the urge or the need or the desire to go sweeping up to a, an important emphasis, emphatic note. But don't give in to the temptation to emphasize your expression. Use the expression to serve the melody that you're playing. So. Our official time is up. I'm still open to some questions or comment or suggestions. Um, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. I've, I've deliberately moved rather quickly through the kind of subject matter which in a group situation, I might do one session each day on one of these subjects and explore and, and solicit examples from participants. We don't have the luxury of doing that. But I think it's wonderful that we have the chance to meet without having to travel anywhere to get to each other and do this. The most important thing is all of this can be reviewed. I hope that some of you find it useful to go back and revisit this whole project, even if just to find the five minute part that interested or intrigued you and do what you can with that. I will be very interested to know, to hear from any of you who tell me that it worked or that it didn't or that you would need further for clarification. And if there's a reason, I, I told Lori back when we first rescheduled this thing, I felt so bad pulling the rug out from all of under all of you. I said, let people review all this. And if there are lingering questions or, or, or something, I will happily reschedule gratis a little follow-up session for us to discuss these things with each other. Maybe spend 30 minutes or so 
So collect your thoughts, but review all this stuff first. Communicate with Lori if you want that to happen, and I'll gladly agree to making that happen. And look forward to it as, as well. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, so I, I, let's just quickly open up uh, this final Q&A if there are any last questions for you. I mean, you have been addressing questions throughout, but you never know. One might have come up at the end. No, well, in, if that is in fact the case. Oh, sorry. Nope. There's a question. I have a, just a maybe a silly question. Um, one, Claire, one baby clarinetist to a very experienced clarinetist. Um, how do you, um, well, my question was going to be, do you have, um, a favorite, um, ornament or embellishment that you like to tastefully employ in your music? A oh, favorite a good, one. It's yeah. a great question. My favorite one is the one that sounds best at this particular moment. <laughs> You, you remind me to mention something, though. A, a, a lot is made of the Krechts. And mm. I don't, and I got to say, this is, this is a powerful and, and important expression that we use a lot in klezmer music, but it's used in other musical idioms as well. I find it in Greek music, for instance, where it has a very different effect in the music, but that's, that's a subject for its own. There's a thing I want to point out. I know lots of teachers emphasize the the so-called crest. I'm calling it so-called because there is no there is no officialness to this term. Klezmorum in the era of Klezmorum did not use that term for that. And it seems to be borrowed from cantorial music usage, but it doesn't mean the same thing always in cantorial music that is the way we now use it in klezmer music. But there is a thing that I hear a lot, which is that people are in such a hurry to do it that they don't give the principal note its due. So I hear a lot of, but we need to, but we need to lean into the tone, hear the cracks and cracks and have it deliver us to the next tone. And I hear too much of, It's done in a hurry. Do not always do it in a hurry. Do it in a hurry when the music is hurried. This makes sense, but... There, doing it abruptly and in a hurry doesn't make sense. So at this moment, that's my favorite ornament because it's the one that fits these phrases I'm playing to try and show you something. But no, there is no favorite. And like I said, I think the more important part of my answer is I, at a certain point, I stopped thinking about ornaments the same way I stopped thinking about where I raise and lower the pitch of my voice or the delivery when I want to get my point across. I simply know how to do it. And I think each of us uh, take all of the, the ornaments that you have and I say, go ahead and overuse them. Use them so much that you get sick of them. And then you only want to use them where they make sense. When people tell you don't overuse ornaments, don't back away and don't be afraid, you'll be forever creeping forward trying to figure, well, is this okay? Is that okay? I say, go ahead, use them, overuse them, get sick of them, and then try to play a melody without them. And every now and then you'll realize you have to do it here. It, it just sounds so natural, you will do it there. And you will make a discovery and it'll make you happy. And that will make me happy. Great, thank you so much. And thank you so much for this whole um, workshop. It's been really uh, illuminating and wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Marty Morgenbesser, an, an old friend and face from long ago, who I'm always delighted to hear from, sent a little message and he said, if Kurt has time, I'd love to hear him talk about the ways in which his understanding and expression of the music has evolved over the years. I wish I could, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could answer that, but, cause, but I, I, I don't know how, I would have to go through, uh, I don't know, but a thing that maybe relates to this, and I hope you find, I hope you all find this interesting. I like many kinds of music. I love jazz of many different eras. I play it sometimes, sometimes better than others. 
I love Baroque era music. I, I, Bach's music continues to amaze me and just leave me like a ball of jelly in, a, in amazement <laughs> with the genius and at the profoundness of what he says with music. Uh, Renaissance and late medieval music fascinate me. And, and even though the clarinet didn't exist in the Renaissance, I love playing uh, 15th and 16th century music on the clarinet in, in ensembles of clarinet where we play vial consort music, but on a family of clarinets, a consort of clarinets of various sizes, many other kinds of music. In all the different kinds of music that I'm involved in, including cha classical chamber music and such, I have the feeling that klezmer music educated me about elements that I realize are universal to all these other kinds of music. These things that I'm saying about delivering tones that decay gracefully, that, that have a feeling of propulsion rather than just sitting there and being articulated the way it says in the score. I find that this, this applies to many kinds of music, but klezmer music was the music where I needed, wanted so desperately to make it feel the way I felt it should feel that I discovered how to do it and then found that my discoveries were just general music. I find myself coaching players of chamber music, telling them to do the same things that I'm telling people to do in klezmer music. But it was the it was my experience of it in klezmer music that brought it to me. And there we there there we go. Oh, and this maybe relates to my development in klezmer music. My teacher for one year when I was in university an age and a half ago was also the principal clarinetist in the Chicago Symphony at the time, a guy pretty well known around the world named Larry Combs. And I would bump in, he lived here in the same town where I live and I would bump into him from time to time here and there. Sometimes I would attend a performance where he played or I, uh, I found him in the audience at a performance of another thing where um, um, we just saw each other as we were going out and we were, and we were, we were heading out the doors and he greeted me and he said, so I, are you still involved in, in klezmer music? Uh, like I heard you had gotten deeply into that. And I said, yes. And I said, uh, so that seems to be the thing that I really at home at. I said, it's, I said, I love many kinds of music, but when I play klezmer music, I know how I want it to sound. And I just babbled this out. He, he's a guy who kind of intimidates me in a way. I, I feel sort of in awe of him. So I often talk, when I encounter him and talk to him, I later hear myself just going blah, 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 blah. But in this case, this is the little blubbering thing that came out. And he stopped and he looked at me and says, that's exactly very important. <laughs> and yeah. and I, realized, I realized he understood what I meant. In classical music, a lot of time is spent teaching people, well, observe these notes. So when it's got a little, you play the note short and staccato, and then you play it long, and then you try it with this, and then you crescendo. It's taught to us as a series of operations. But if you manage to mature in that music, if you manage to mature as a player, you get to the point where those indications just point you in the direction you're going, but you have to find and hear the music that's that was underlying that. And it might come from the composer and it might come partly from you, but you have to find it. You have to have an intention that you're doing it because you want it to sound this way and not because the score says mezzo forte, staccato, cantabile, whatever. And he understands that in the context of classical music. And I found I understand that in the context of klezmer music. I feel I might be wrong, but I feel like I know what this music is ready to say, what it can say, and how I can help it to say that. And I go there and I let the music carry me there. I'll close with the words of a friend of mine, a guitar builder who I used to work with. I used to make guitars once upon a time, um, who was himself a, a passionate uh, devotee of um, flamenco music. And he says, it's one thing to possess the music. It's another thing to let the music possess you. And I agree with that. That I'll was a wonderful there, note to end on. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, and on, Thank on, you, on, Laurie. On behalf of uh, everybody here, hey, feel free to unmute yourselves, give an actual thank you, a real round of applause. Uh, thank you so much.